it's my great pleasure to introduce the talented Cantonese opera performer and dedicated teacher of this art form. She's also the principal performer and artistic director of Vancouver uh, Cantonese Opera Company. Rosa Cheng, welcome. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Fine, thank you. How are you? Very good, thank you. It's the morning there, I believe. Uh, yes, it's about 10.30 in the morning. Yes, Pacific time. Great. Well, we're going to take a deep dive into Cantonese opera to look behind the scenes and discover the significance of the many features which make up this art form. Uh, Rosa, though, can you begin by telling us a little bit of your background and what brought you to the world of Cantonese opera? Okay. I, um, I was born in Hong Kong and I immigrated to Vancouver uh, in 1975. And I start, when I was young, Cantonese opera was considered as old fashioned and we just liked the pop music. Not until 1993, uh, when I was in Vancouver, uh, I started learning Cantonese opera. And then, and then when I think, well, playing by myself is no fun. So I started teaching free to my friends uh, every Sunday. Then we, we practiced the performing arts technique. And then in year 2000, we have a group of friends really interested. So we formed the Vancouver Cantonese Opera in year 2000 and registered as a nonprofit. And then in 20, uh, 2005, we were uh, designated as a charitable organization by the federal government. That means if people donate to us, they can get a uh, donation uh, income tax receipt. Then that's how long ago? That's 23 years ago now. Wow. But, um, yeah, we're performing every year and we do community outreach. We teach singing and performing technique classes. And also we have a program called Opera in, the, Opera in Care. We, uh, we visited senior homes and hospital and perform there. So what we say, we will do our full opera makeup and costume and perform our Cantonese opera in the hospital or the care home. So we bring our theater to them. What we call is called bamboo theater. And then later you will know what is bamboo theater. Brilliant. And then recently we are also trying to do fusion opera, like combination of different genre, uh, different art form. Mm -hmm. uh, like jazz or indigenous music, something like this. Okay. And I'm really thank you for inviting me today. It's such a pleasure and it's so interesting. I mean, what for you would you say constitutes Cantonese opera and like how does it differ perhaps uh, from, is it the same as Chinese opera? What, what would you say? Okay, Cantonese opera was inscribed on the in. UNESCO list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity in September, 2009. And Cantonese opera is one of the major um, opera categories, like because China have 31 provinces in, uh, in China and every province speak different dialect and they have their own opera. So Cantonese opera is the Southern part, uh, Guangdong's opera, but we sing in Cantonese dialect. Okay, um, how popular is it and where does it mostly happen? I mean, outside of Vancouver, where can people see it or where does it, where is it performed most? And... Okay, um, it performed mostly in the, um, the, the, South, the Southeast Asia part, like the uh, Vietnam, <coughs> Singapore, um, also Malaysia, um, and then, and then any Cantonese speaking communities and also in North America, like uh, San Francisco, um, uh, New York and anywhere that has Cantonese speaking population, we have Cantonese opera. It's popular. Yeah. Yes. Um, has it continued to be popular because it's an old art form? I mean, let's actually talk about the history of the art form. When, and where did it, so you said where it originated from. When was that? How long ago? <laughs> okay, I, I think Cantonese opera, um, first of all, Cantonese opera is a transformation or the extension of Chinese opera. So Chinese opera actually considered to begin 
in the Tang Dynasty, which is about 712 to 755 AD. And there was the Emperor Mingguo who founded a Pearl Garden. That's the first operational troop in China. And then the exact origin of Cantonese opera are open to debate. But general consensus is that the art form migrated from the north to the southern province of Guangdong during the Song Dynasty, which is 1179 to 1276 AD. So um, it's a very it's a unique art for art form because um, it combines singing, martial arts, uh, miming, and dialogue, and it's a combination of almost everything. Yeah. And the opera serves three major social functions, like its entertainment, both rural and urban areas, and a medium of communication and education, okay. and constitute the core or supplement of many ritual uh, religious activities, like the deity's birthday. And who would be watching it? Was it um, available to everyone, or was it just people, wealthy people, or did everyone see it? Okay, um, I think in the um, in the olden day, before we have any theater, and we have traveling uh, Cantonese opera troupe, they were on on board a boat called the Red Boat. So they travel to villages to villages when they have um, festival or deities' uh, birthday. So they build some kind of um, um, like a theater by bamboo, what we call bamboo theater, but they are all free. Okay. Those theaters are all free. People, any people can watch. So right. gradually, then, then we, when we perform in theaters, of course, you have to buy tickets to get in to watch. Okay. Um, the plot lines, they're mostly derived from traditional folklore, I believe, and all works of literature. Are there any new productions being created or different stories being told? now? Yes, traditionally we perform traditional repertoire, mm -hmm. but recently as um, because we we try to update the Cantonese opera, so there are many, many new uh, repertoire being written by many playwrights in China and in uh, Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. And actually in, in Vancouver, we are trying to do the same. Yeah. Great. I mean, is, and that would also lead to maybe some younger people being reintroduced to Cantonese opera, I guess, if it's, you know, when there's new blood uh, infused in it and new ideas. Yes, that is the very, very important step that we have to take because Cantonese opera is, um, people consider it as old fashioned and uh, too long because one Cantonese opera performance last about three hours. Who has time to sit three hours to watch a show? So we really have to change. Yeah, we, definitely, we have to update ourselves, definitely. Um, to say Cantonese opera performers are multi-talented is probably an understatement because like you said, they, the art incorporates music, song, dance, martial arts, and acrobatics. How many years on average does it take to train? to do this? Um, in China, when they have those um, opera institutes, they teach, started from maybe eight years old. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So they, of course, they have uh, education in the institute too. So, but mainly every day they will practice, they will learn the Cantonese opera, and then they also study other subjects. Um, but that is for anyone who really in you want to be trained as an opera artist. But in Hong Kong or in like, like us in North America, uh -huh. no such thing as institute. So we, we will find a good teacher to teach us the basic. And then we learn, like we learn and upgrade ourselves continuously. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so it's, I mean, yeah, it seems like a very long process because yeah. of the of the amount of talents, uh, multi-talented, like I said. Yeah. Um, and and just on that as well, um, the you said you did outreach, and so what kind of people would like come to your classes? Um, it's not is it just Chinese people or Chinese origin, or like do many people come to, from different? Um, my students usually they are past fifty 
50 years old. Oh, wow. <laughs> Actually, I, 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 at that, that is encouraging when, <clears throat> when people, like most, most of our, my students are students that they were busy when they were young, raising family, mm -hmm. uh, making a living, buying houses. Then when they almost semi-retire or when their children all grow up and out of the nest, so they, they have more time and then they start coming to learn what they really want to learn when they were younger. But the problem is when they come at that age, they not when you start learning, say for instance, if you start learning piano at when you are five or six, it's easy, right? Uh -huh. But then when you start learning when you are 50, 60, that is a different story. But the only thing to keep them going is for their interest, for their own enjoyment. I always tell them, you come to learn is for your own enjoyment. If yeah, you're happy, yeah. keep going. And then when you are gradually getting better and better, then you can start entertaining others. Right, right. I mean, basically you're right. If you just to do something that you enjoy can be enough sometimes. Um, yes. For many of us watching Cantonese opera without any knowledge, it can be enjoyable because of the spectacle of the colors, the elaborate costumes, and the acrobatics as well, the routines. But having some knowledge of the nuances can go a long way in understanding and enjoying the art form. How important is it for you that an audience has some understanding before viewing Cantonese opera? Yes, usually before I have a performance, I always give three workshops to give, to give them some ideas what is Cantonese opera. So first of all, I will do a makeup demonstration and tell them why we are using this color, why we are doing this. And then after that, they have some knowledge about at least the makeup, why we look like that. And then after that, we will give them more information on the music, on the orchestra, yeah. Right. So, Rosie, you have actually supplied us with wonderful video clips uh, that illustrate all of the different components. And I think so we're going to start with a look at the clip um, that you've made uh, on the signature makeup now. And maybe you can talk us through it. So. OK. If you want to start already. Yeah. OK. The red and white signature makeup is a long and specialized process. Each role has its own style of makeup. The finished look must be bright, strong, and exaggerated to be effective under the bright stage lighting. So in this demo, this is the Fadan, the female role. And first of all, he has to tie up his hair and they put a white foundation on to cover the entire face and a creamy red brusher to apply on her cheek, eyelid, and both sides of her nose. And then the white face powder is applied loosely all over the face to set the color. And the red is stronger from the side and gradually fading towards the nose. This gives the face a more sculptured, sculptured look. And outline the eyes with black eyeliner to form the phoenix eyes, slightly slanting towards the temples. And the eyeshadow is applied to shape and accentuate the eyes. Thick dark eyebrows are carefully painted on. They are elongated and slightly slanted towards the temple. And then mascara is applied. Bright red lip color is carefully painted on. And then hair and head pieces are incredibly detailed with many pieces. So I don't know if Ho can also share the screen of the video because I don't know. I can see it on my screen. You can't see it, Rosa? No, I can't see it. Oh, oh dear. Okay. Uh, I think our, I can see it and our viewers can see it. Um, so at the moment, yeah, if, uh, if you could do that so Rosa could see it too. Um, that's a shame. Yeah. So the, I was speaking too fast or too slow for the video. No, it's it it was great. Um, I mean it's beautiful video. Um, and uh, yeah, somebody there, one of our panelists is saying I can see it too, and I'm a viewer. So they were watching it. So the signature look there, actually, Rosa, um, that we were looking at, is that a particular character? Yes, 
that is the female road and what we call in Cantonese is fa dan. And in the makeup and the hairpiece that she has on is for married women in our opera. But if in the Beijing opera, this different. Beijing opera for maiden and married woman, they all have the same hairstyle. But in Cantonese opera is much more different. Right, I mean, how long is, that's a very quick time video that we're watching, speed it up. How long would that actually take to do one person like that? Okay, uh, for for a newly, uh, new artist who just learned, started learning, it takes maybe two, three hours. And, but for um, experienced artists, they might take an hour and a half, including everything, like costume, everything, then get ready to stand beside, stand in front of the, the stage door. So it's the experience. And also you need to practice. It doesn't mean if you learn how to do it, doesn't mean you will be a good artist, makeup artist. You have to practice, 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 make Perfect. Practice makes perfect. That's a, yeah. a lot. Yeah. But you can understand why it takes so long. And uh, Nevin um, has just said that the transformation was incredible. Yeah. You, it's brilliant to see the layers and each piece go yeah. on. We also have another clip and this one is on the hair and the hair pieces. So let's have a look. And again, if you could talk us through it, here we go. But I can't see Rosa. Okay. I can't. But anyway, that's okay. Okay, this in this demo, oh, I can see it now. Uh -huh. In this demo, you can see um, I was doing the, um, before every, what we call binji is real human hair. And then after each performance, we have to clean it with the tree bark. This is the tree bark from China. And then we soak it in hot water and squeeze it. So some jelly, jelly stuff uh, substance came out, almost like a natural glue. So then you have to style it the way like this to put it back on your forehead before the show. So uh, this is a very critical step because it will shape your face, the desired oval shape. And then many strips of ribbons are tied around the head to firmly secure the hair fringes. So um, it's, and then after that, like you saw the, in the first video, they will put a lot of uh, jewels and pearls to according to the character they play right so yeah I mean it's funny when I watched this before I thought it was I thought what you were rubbing into it was seaweed like the sort of um the seaweed also has a kind of glue from it so that's from a tree yes it's a tree bark but oh. you can only have those tree they, you, you only find those tree in China so we have to import it right and is the hair actually real hair Yes, it's real human hair. You cannot right. use synthetic hair because synthetic hair, they just won't stay in shape. Okay. Yeah, human hair. Okay, amazing. Um, do, the, do the artists have to take great care when they remove it after a performance because do you reuse it or do you have to do that every time? Okay, after we shape it in the shape, they will put some uh, eye, you know, eyelashes glue Yes. In, on, on the uh, the the pinji, yeah, and then yeah. put it on your forehead, so then it stays because our show lasts three and a half hours, and then after that you after you take it off, you will uh, let it dry, then every time before you the show again you do this repeat the same process, you never never watch it with shampoo never, you just leave it there, then every time when you you reshape it with the those up tree bark uh, natural glue. Mm -hmm. then um, it will keep the shape. Once you shampoo it, because you wash away all the residue of the, tr the natural gel, then it, you will have a very hard time to reshape it in the shape. Wow. Yeah. A lot of, uh, so many things, so many parts to this. Um, if we can focus on the costume next, um, again, each piece has meaning and informs the viewer about the characters. Rosa, can you fill us in on this uh, while we watch the clip? And also just sure. to say, um, the panelists there, Anna, she's saying, fascinating. I didn't know that many <laughs> hair pieces and steps were involved instead of just one wig. Yeah, amazing. Okay. <laughs> costume used mainly based on the main dynasty and also indicates the character and status of each role. The different layers of under 
they first of all they have to put on the undergarments and the microphone before put on the outer garment. And this is the married woman uh, costume. And this is for the hero, the hero part. And you can see the white garment is the undergarment. And then they are tying the, the hat securely. And then there's also some accessory, the pom pom beside his eye, ears. So, and this is the costume for a hero. And you always have costume technicians to help you, sometimes one, sometimes two together, because it's very complicated and elaborate uh, steps. Mm -hmm. So this is the hero. And this one is for the queen or princess, the royal prince or prince, princess, the costume, and also the headdress. Uh, it's pretty heavy sometimes, you can feel. And that is the princess and queen. And with the water sleeve, the white part is called what we call the water sleeve. And this is the costume for the general. And you can see there were four flags behind him. And this is the armor when they go to war. See, they have, um, it's difficult to put on those flags because when you go on stage, you move, you fight. If not securely secured, then the flag will move. Okay, and somebody, uh, Maya is asking, what is the queen holding? It looks like okay. a scepter ring. Yeah, that that you can say when we say uh, we went to, when we kid is what called a hula hoop. Okay, but actually, what we call is the gok dai, is represent like a ranking in the in the the government or in the palace. So all when you watch the Chinese opera, you can see all the officer or the queen or the princess, when they wear something like this, they always have this hula hoop, this cork die. Okay. That's one of the accessory you cannot miss. Thank you uh, for that. And thank you, Maya, for the question. And Luna is also asking, uh, can Rosa answer, um, what would be the difference in hairstyle for married versus single women characters? Okay. I don't know if I've, uh, this is for the married women because you can see the two long piece hair on the side, in, in, front, in, in the front, right? The right. long one. So mm -hmm. of course those are not real, real hair, but that represents this is a married woman. And also you can see the bun at the back of, on the top of the hair, head, yeah. the bun. And that is also means that a married woman. So in, for uh, anyone who is not married, it's different hairstyle. Okay, brilliant. And um, I mean, considering the precise artistry of movement and some of the costumes look incredible, like you said, they're very elaborate. They look heavy and difficult to maneuver with grace. How do they, uh, how do, they do it? Actually, nowadays, the uh, costume already improve a lot. Wow. Now it's mainly embroidery. In the <laughs> olden days, maybe 1950 or something, they wearing costume with sequins. So those sequins are very heavy. Mm. But now, nowadays, the, the embroidery, you look, when you look at it, it's very elaborate. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's not heavy at all. But of course, you compare to our, our own daily uh, clothing is different. But okay. it's, it's like, but the armor, you see the general wearing the armor that is very heavy. Yeah. And yeah. also, you need to really getting used to it. Because once you have all the flag tight mm -hmm. and the flag in the, in, at, the, on, at the back, uh, you really have to take a deep breath to, uh, <laughs> to stand straight. Yeah, it, yeah. it takes training. It takes your uh, perseverance, perseverance or something. Yeah, yeah. perseverance. And yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, traditionally, were all the roles performed by men? And, and if so, why was this? Yes, a long time ago, actually, uh, I think in the later of Qing dynasty, maybe 1916 or something, at that time, there were still only men performing. Then gradually uh, the women start uh, acting. So mm -hmm. that's liberation, I think. And actually nowadays in Hong Kong, most and many of the ma male roles were played by women. The one I think, I think one of the reason is because now but of course, the, all those professional male roles were played by men, but amateurs, actors, performers, female role, ma female playing male role because 
is amateur. The man has to work, has their own career. But in China, in the uh, professional trip, all male play male role, female right. play female role. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just as a, a an extra to the costume, um, there's also we have a clip of water sleeve demonstration by yourself. Um, and you could explain why the sleeves and the water sleeves are so important um, as well to us, if that's possible. I think it does have, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. The use of water sleeve is very much part of the man play. Man plays is a play mainly with singing and note fighting scenes. And the sleeves are double white silk sleeve attached to the cuffs of a costume. The different way the actor moves and swing the sleeve express different emotions such as sadness, shyness. This is shyness, fear, anger, flirtatious, etc. And this is a basic technique that all Cantonese, Cantonese actors must master. So this is sad, weeping, sad. And every time you have to have the sleeve go up get up your sleeve again. So this is like a playful carp. It's great to watch because I just can imagine if any of us were trying this at home, we would just uh -huh. be in a tangle on the floor right now. Uh -huh. <laughs> when we were small, when we, when we were young, uh, in the olden day, after we watched the Cantonese opera, we would take a pair of our parents' pants. You know, they, <laughs> that time the pants are really wide, like the wide one. So we would sleep, put our hands through the pants and then do this. <laughs> it's interesting. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so again, each piece like this kind of thing, just the small movements, but... Um, they have all this meaning. I mean, you can see it on your face as well. I can see it watching you there. Um, the shy, the sad, uh, but the conveyance of the water sleeves like adds to that so much. Um, yeah. there's, um, there's two types um, of play. Uh, so we have time for this. It's Mo and Mong. Can you describe the different skills required? And I think we do have a video to go with it, but yeah. Okay, the man play, that means is tends to be more intellectual, culture, cultured and gentle. And there are more twists and turns in the storyline and movement are softer, slower and more elegant. So this is the princess. So that was my performance in 2004. And the performers show off their emotions by their facial experience tone of voice and meaning behind each movement of their water sleeve. So she is in front of a shrine and then playing to the ancestor. So you can see they use the water sleeve to help to express the feeling and also like when you see I flip my sleeve and then I, I watch look over there. So it's almost like a dance. And do you do you do both of those in uh, Vancouver, the Vancouver Opera? Um, you do Mon and Mo. Yeah, yeah. So the following is the Mo Mo play is a fight with fighting scenes, and um, actions orientated stories using martial arts and acrobatic skill is intricately choreographed. And the actor have to master acrobatic and gymnastic skills in their daily practice. 
as well as the position hand and eye coordination in the use of the weapon on stage. So see, all these performers are wearing the armor with the flag behind them. So before when, we're, when we were re rehearsing or practicing, we really have to wear the, the flag on our back to practice. Otherwise, if you never wear it, then when you get on stage, you will be in a mess. <laughs> yeah. So when you practice, we wear these costumes to practice. Right. I mean, I'm just thinking of all the uh, other people who were also helping them get ready. It must have taken oh. me. So yes. Yeah. This is the first long play we play at year 2000. We have, I think, um, over 20 performers. Then we have costume technicians, at least 15 or 12. Yeah. So because to put on those flags, you really need to have someone who is knowledgeable how to do it. Yeah, because see, when you, you have all those flags on your back, you don't just sit, stand there. You move and you fight. So these are the painter face, two characters painter face. So each face painting represents different character. Oh. And the, 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 the one with the, the lady is the grandma, the grandma of the family, the, the, almost like a dowager's. Of, uh -huh. And what she is holding is a sword and also the command flag for the whole army. So this is the, uh, what do you call that, army. So she is checking on the army, everybody line up, almost like a parade or something like that. Parade, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. before the, the, the war. Right, checking out the uh, that everybody's looking ship shape, I guess. Um, yeah. We have a, a question from Kami. She says about um, the five Phoenix troop in Hong Kong were all women playing male and female roles. So I guess, yeah, relating to when we were talking about how in, back in history that a lot of the, um, all the characters would have been played by men. Um, yeah. So thank now you. Now all much. characters can be pay, played by women now. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever done an all female um, version of any of these? Uh, almost, almost, but not all, because like, uh, like when you see the first uh, month videos, the the character as male character playing with me, but actually she he he is a she. She is a professional opera artist called Ho Wailing. So. Yeah, she's playing the male role and she has been my partner for 20 years now, over 20 years. Can you tell she's a woman? No. <laughs> yeah, because like with the costume, with the makeup and also the way he, she perform, they learn the role so you cannot tell. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Um, and I think, yeah, another, another element we're going to look at now, um, uh, is the music and traditional instruments. Um, <clears throat> so if we could have that clip, please hold, that's great. And you can tell us maybe a little bit yeah. more. Traditionally, Cantonese opera music is divided into wind, string, and percussions. And, and also is influenced by both Western and Eastern culture. Mm -hmm. And usually we have six musicians. And this is the Gao Wu, that's the main, well, the main the violin, and then the yang qing is almost like a piano, um, a string piano. Mm -hmm. And then this is pipa, very famous instrument, very, very um, excellent instrument, musical instrument. You and, see uh, a lot of paintings, Chinese paintings often, and things, you see this instrument, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And a cello is a Western instrument. But uh, Cantonese opera adopt anything that is good. So <laughs> cello, and now later on, we also have saxophone, but I don't have the photo there. Saxophone okay. is one of our main instrument. Diji, diji is almost like a flute, a flute in Western opera. But this one is made of bamboo. And the yun is the bass, all string instrument. Mm -hmm. And the percussions. So it controls the overall rhythm and pace of the music. And the gong. Mm -hmm. 
and also the symbol. And I like to say, and, and this is the very important instrument, sauna. What do you call that sauna in, uh, in English? It looks like- It's almost like a pipe. Yeah, uh, or trumpet, a, a trumpet. bugle or a trumpet. Yeah, English. it's very loud. And we use this instrument mostly in uh, the Mo play, like, like the last video when you watch the, uh, the, the yeah. wages came out. Mm -hmm. They always use this instrument. And one of the uh, misconceptions from the Western um, uh, audience is they thought Cantonese opera or Chinese opera very noisy. Mm -hmm. It's so noisy, I don't like it. But actually they don't know is the percussion in Cantonese opera and any Chinese opera is the heartbeat, heartbeat of a human being. Without the heartbeat, the art form is dead. Why I say is heartbeat? Because, because if you are familiar with the opera, each rhythm is, cons is a uh, movement. Like if, when you, if a performer on stage is drinking a wine, mm -hmm. then they have a certain rhythm for them to, to do the action. Mm -hmm. Or if he, that performer is kneeling down, then another different, uh, different rhythm. Right. So this is a traditional Chinese instrument, orchestra. How many people usually consist of the orchestra? Is it different amounts depending where you are or? Okay, uh, this is the percussion, the, the percussion, uh, percussionist. And you see the, the guy from the on left second, the second on the left is the main, the percussion director. Right. On the left, yeah. He control those, the three beside him, they, they are just the uh, percussionist assistant. They look at him. They look at him, not look at his face, look at his hand. Look at his, he was holding a bamboo, a stick, two sticks. Those mm -hmm. st two sticks, just like the conductor's uh, baton. Sure. So yeah. um, they look at his hand. If he plays, if he plays his hand on one side, then they know what is, what they supposed to do. Okay. I don't know any percussions, but that's the way they look. They don't look at, they don't have any, any um, manuscript or music score in front of them. They don't look at it. Just the percussionist director look at the music score, but the rest of them, they don't. They just look at his hand. So that yeah. person is very pivotal, very important person. Yes, yeah. very important. Yeah. And okay. He controls the rhythm with the two sticks. And it takes years and years of training. You have to memorize all the rhythm, and then you have to, to practice your hand. It's amazing. And so, like you said, for the performers, for the actors uh, and on stage and the performance on stage, that so the, the rhythm of the, the percussion, as you said, it's like, um, like a... Um, Emotion to, to what's happening next to what yes. to do. yeah like a yeah a musical hint or tip that this is happening next or yeah okay. no no what oh. what they do is the performer do the action and the percussionist will will do the rhythm uh -oh, so the performer is the lead the percussion is follow oh, and okay. then the music so like. You really have to understand this is just not just noise. This is the rhythm, the heartbeat. So if you get to know more about the rhythm, then you will appreciate what's happening. Why we have this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, so many things. It's so intricate. Um, we also, so you mentioned earlier on about bamboo theater. Um, so that's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about and that people went out and brought it to, to the people where they were and built these places. So we're going to have a little look at that yeah. now with our clip. Thank you. Thank so you. bamboo theater is mainly when the troupe, the Cantonese opera troupe traveled to different part of the of that like villages when they have festival or they have the deity's birthday. So actually the opera played at the bamboo theater is not played for human, for the mortal. They are playing for the deity and the God. But of course the mortal can come and watch. 
So, and not like you can see, they are all built with bamboo and also uh, twined. No, not even one nail is used in this building of bamboo theater. Wow. So then see is, but, but it's temporary, right? But it's, see, this is the largest bamboo theater in Hong Kong. And at night is decorated with all this light. It's, it's amazing. It's really when you go there, you feel so happy, so festive. Yeah, and this is the backstage of the bamboo theater. And all these are the costume and the accessory. And the, see, they hang the costume on top of the um, bamboo theater. Yeah. And this is the, the, the theater. But usually before they start the bamboo theater, they have all kinds of uh, rituals with the uh, dragon dance. And, and now the, they, they, they are watching, they are waiting. So no, they don't sell tickets at the beginning. Of course, now they might be different. Right. You give donations. So this is the bamboo theater, but the, the, the orchestra are sitting on the, when you are audience looking on the left side of the stage. And, and you see, they are not in tuxedo or any, any jacket because it's so hot in Hong Kong. And in bamboo theater, there's no air condition. So everybody is so casual. But this, sorry, in, this, imagine, the, imagine the, the performer with all the costume they were just sweating. Yeah, they must um, endurance, I guess. Um, but this one, this particular one we're looking at in Hong Kong, this isn't a temporary one. Yeah, they are. They are performing in a, a bamboo theater. So this this theater is just temporary for this time. Yeah, it lasts maybe one or two weeks. Wow. Yeah, one or two weeks, and then they will disassemble it and then take away all the bamboo again. The next year they come back again and then do the same thing. Oh, okay. There's a lot, lot, so much to go into it. Um, and you've, um, I guess, also, I think we, yeah, we're good for this one. There's a little bit more to it. And um, there's another question. Oh, is there a bamboo theater in California? Do you know? Um, okay, in, I don't think there's any, Bamboo theater in North America. First of all, do we have a lot of bamboo here? Not really until you or you can import it, but it's not their culture. I can, Vancouver Cantonese Opera has a bamboo theater in the city of Richmond in BC, but what just, just the name of the theater because it's an outdoor theater, uh, a stage. So we name, that is our stage. So we call it bamboo theater. And it's almost like, uh, like every year when the city of Richmond have a world festival. So we have our own stage. That stage is called Bamboo Theater. But no, not in America, not in North America, we have any Bamboo Theater. You might have Bamboo Theater in Malaysia, Singapore, or, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, or um, Vietnam, in the Southeast Asia, but not here, not, not, not in North America. Uh, Luna said, yeah, good point. Not enough bamboo here in California or the yeah. USA. Yeah, Luna. Um, and actually, the fact that they don't use nails and it's done with twine and bamboo, the f it's it's quite ecologically quite sound, I imagine, yeah. because they can reuse. Great. Um, Timothy is saying, when the, the singing, the singing, the sound, when si sorry, when singing, the sound is very unique and distinctive. Is there a reason why the performance is sung in this manner? Thanks, Timothy. Um, okay. Um, actually, Cantonese operas, the technique for Cantonese opera singing is very much different from the Western opera singing. So uh, one of the characteristic of Cantonese opera singing is the female, they sing in soprano, mm -hmm. but our soprano is not like the Western opera soprano. And, and also like, uh, um, also when we sing, we, the diction is more important than the, than the music. Like say, for instance, in Cantonese, in Cantonese, we have so many different intonations. So one character might mean two different meanings. So when we sing, we cannot sing if the melody is do, re, mi, fa, so, I can, if it's so, but if that so is not, not when we, when we speak the character, cannot say like, just like, 
，你好嘛？你好嘛？大家好 ，say 个大。So if you say 大家好 ，it will mean different things. So when we sing, we have to sing 大 We cannot follow the melody if the melody is 大 I cannot sing 大 I still have to sing 大 So in in Cantonese, what we say 强奸公尺 that means we rip the music note. We don't follow the music note. We sing what it's meaning. So that's the way Cantonese opera is singing. And also when we sing the the female role, like that's the way we sing. But I think in the Western opera, it's different. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. As you said, intonation is hugely important, or otherwise yeah. you're not saying the saying a different word or has a different meaning. So yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense when you say it. Yes. Um, so looking at Lunar New Year in Vancouver, um, as we are approaching, um, is it a big deal in Vancouver? And and what are the main um, Chinese New Year activities? Yes, it was a big deal in Vancouver. Every year, Chinese New Year, we have a parade in Chinatown. That was before the pandemic. This really, but now that that was two years ago, and it was really fun. Yeah, it it was really fun. Go watching, or you take part in the parade. Um, the, I hope this tradition will keep going. Yeah, Actually, and also they sorry. also have a lot of other activities in Chinatown too. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if I asked. I think I didn't. But what is the population in Vancouver of people of Chinese origin? Uh, I don't really know the statistics, oh, oh. but but we have lots of Chinese uh, populations. But nowadays, the recent, like recently, the immigrations from China or from Hong Kong, the Chinese usually a lot of them speak Mandarin, so uh, we have less. Immigrants from Hong Kong, but maybe we will have more later. I don't know. So that means now the balance is most people, more people speak Mandarin, and then so Cantonese opera is uh, is diminishing. We our audience is diminishing. Right. Um, we also we have time for the uh, video nine. If we can show that one, please, Ho, and let's have a look at that. I think it's three minutes. Ah, oh, okay. And maybe you can just fill us in on, on this about the lion. Dance. Okay. In China, we have two types of lions. One is Southern and the Northern. The Northern part lions in like in the Beijing area, the Northern part and the Southern part lions is in the Southern part of the China, like the Guangzhou and the Southeast Asia, like Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, they all have southern lions. So you can see the difference is the northern lions, they wear costumes, including like the whole costume. Like when you look at them, you can see a, almost like a real lions. And they also act like they are lions, the, the, all the, um, the movement and see all the movement and the, the face. Sometimes you can almost see that the facial uh, expression. They wink their, their, yeah, they wink their eyes. So yeah. of course it needs years of training to do this. You can tell, yeah, it's acrobatic. It's yes. a dance, wow. So you can see the costume match the, the whole, the hat and everything. But in the Southern Alliance, it's not the same. You need a lot of training. So this is the Southern Lion, Lam Si. Okay. See, you can see this Southern Lions have a long tail and with two performer, one in the front and one in the back. And this Northern Lion is different. The Northern Lion is just a costume, right? But this one, they have long tail. Can they hear the English? Uh, the, can the audience hear the English? The because it was... To symbolize wisdom yeah. and longevity. 
it has sharp teeth on the side of its mouth of a white tiger to symbolize strength and courage. During auspicious events like Chinese New Year, you'll probably see the southern Chinese lions come out and play, along with percussions and firecrackers to bring good luck and fortune to the people. Every dance tells a story that reflects values that are important to the Chinese community. Respect. The lion shows respect to different lion dancing teams, Buddhas and deities by being humble and bowing to them. Courage. The lion shows their courage by overcoming challenging obstacles, no matter how high the obstacles are or how they are dancing on top of pole. The lion will always give it its best shot. Wow. Spirit. The lion moves in a spirited fashion, driven by the drums, cymbals and gong. Brotherhood or mateship. A pride of lions are always loyal to each other and they will work together to overcome any difficulties. Most importantly, lion dancing brings people together to foster teamwork, leadership and develop strong community bonds. Amazing. Around the world. It has the eyes of a phoenix okay. to symbolise virtue. A large protruding forehead and long beard of a dragon to symbolise intelligence. A broad head like the shell of a tortoise to symbolize wisdom and longevity. It has sharp teeth on the Thank you, Ho. <laughs> Lovely. The, the southern one, that was the last one, yes. Yeah. Um, seemed to be, well, besides the tail, it has um, the jumping ability was incredible. I mean, that takes some training. Yes, definitely. And the southern lion is... is more fears, like more um, more jumping, and the, but the, the northern lion is more like um, playful. Okay, okay. Yeah, you can tell the difference that this one you can see they're jumping, they they have big movements, standing on top of each other, and yeah. they they playing on the uh, the pole, standing on the pole. Mm -hmm. So it's fears, like yeah, <laughs> definitely fears. Um, the northern lion is playful. Right. Uh, okay, that's great to know that as well, because I've never known. And now if I see them, I will know where they come from. Um, are the, uh, from Nevin here, um, are the lion shows the most famous Cantonese opera specific for New Year's? So is the, yeah, I guess he's asking, yeah, is the lion, these lion dances and the lions specifically for New Year? The lions of for New Year and for other festival, especially if like uh, if you open a new restaurant, sometimes you invite a team of lion dance to come to your new restaurant and then they will perform the dance as some kind of good omen or give you good uh, future or good income for future. And then they will visit your, especially the kitchen because kitchen is the heartbeat of the uh, restaurant. So they will go over the whole restaurant and dance. And also with the drumming and the gong and cymbal, they chase away any bad luck. Okay, yeah. okay. so auspicious, auspicious. Um, we have one last uh, video clip we're going to have a look at now. And this is our last clip, the dragon dance. Traditionally, dragon holds a supreme esteemed position within the mythical world. The more majestic dragon dance requires a troupe of multiple dancers to manipulate a colorful, undulating dragon body. It is believed that the loud beats of the drum and cymbal, together with the face of the dragon dancing aggressively, can evict bad or evil spirits. Yeah, so it's also like a very important um, rituals in China. But nowadays, because like it requires so many people participate, the, the dance is getting difficult and difficult. And maybe the, the dragon may be smaller, not that long. And we also have one very uh, spectacular dra dragon in Hong Kong is for, called the fire dragons. They stick the, all the incense on the dragons so they burned all the incense while, while the dragon was dancing. So especially yes, at night, perform at night. So it's very uh, spectacular with the incense burning and the dragon dance and the music. 
Great. Any other questions from our attendees? If you want to put anything else in the chat, but thank you for your questions so far. Rosa, this has been a real eye opener, uh, a really great insight into the art of Cantonese opera. It's been wonderful. I've really enjoyed it, finding out. Um, so, oh, there we go from Victoria. She said, what is the dragon made of? The dragon. Okay, first of all, when they make the dragon, they'll make the frame first. The frame usually is bamboo, bamboo thin, so they wrap it, make a long, almost like a tunnel, right? Then they will, uh, at that time was paper mache, now they will use the, uh, the fabrics to do the, uh, the skin. So it takes a long time, but it has to be flexible. So the, the body, the frame will be different, like not one whole body. So they will be in sections. So you can bend and flexible. Right. Mm. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for the question, Victoria. Um, is there anything else you that we haven't touched on um, about Cantonese opera that you would like to share? Or I think we've have we covered it this evening. Well, and also Cantonese opera, every time before our performance, when we go to the theater, we bring with a, a shrine of our God. It's called Wa Guang. Wa Guang is the patron god of Cantonese opera. So before we go to, when we go to the theater, we set down the shrine and then all the performer has to go in front of Wa Guang and light an incense and then do this, a pray. And then you go also take an incense out on the stage and then the four corner of the stage. And they, they said, if you don't do this, when you get on stage, you will have mistake, you will make mistakes or you will forget your lyrics or your script. Sometimes I think it's true because one time I, 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 I don't know whether I, I uh, pray before Wa Gong, but when I got on stage, I forgot my script. Oh. So when you, when you have something, when you have something like that, people will say, oh, you must have forgotten to pray in front of Wa Gong. So that is, <laughs> that is our patron God. So it's a good ritual to have. Yes. Yes, important ritual. Um, um, Anna says, I noticed from the clips, uh, I noticed the clips from your performance had traditional Chinese and English subtitles. Is there anywhere to watch them online, Rosa? Yes, we do have uh, many, many YouTube um, uh, upload because uh, during the last year, we had uh, called Cantonese Opera in the Cloud and is a, a webinar as in Chinese and English subtitle and narrations. So it's already on our YouTube channel. I'll send Elma the, um, the link. So he, maybe she can post it on the website and you can watch. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. very interesting. We presented our opera performance. Like the first one we, uh, we presented was called the Flower Princess. The one, one of the clip there mm -hmm. is the last princess in the uh, main dynasty. And then we performed, presented the Peony Pavilion. We presented the, um, the ferry of the Emerald Green Lake. Mm -hmm. So three of them. So, yeah. Okay. Well, listen, yeah, Anna, if you want to get in touch um, and I can send you uh, the information from Rosa, you can just get in touch with learning at rmg.co.uk and uh, I'll, I'll get that to you. There's, okay, I have to do one last question. Um, it's from, uh, it's, oh, it's not a question exactly, but um, I grew up watching Cantonese opera and I want to know if they do tours to promote the culture in the US. Interesting question. I think um, in US, San Francisco, LA and New York, they have many, quite a few musical society in, in, in there. So, uh, but in Canada, we also, also have um, in Vancouver, Alberta and uh, Toronto. But we don't do tours because it's expensive and very expensive. So uh, yes. we try, but I, I don't think we can afford to do it. Okay. Um, but nowadays, excuse me, nowadays with the YouTube and everything, I hope everyone will try to help to promote Cantonese opera. Just ask people, go and watch this, then they will know more. Exactly. Yeah, lots of um, 
Thank yous to Rosa for a great presentation, Rosa, and uh, see more of you. They hope to see more of you. Um, someone else says, great, great. I used to watch it with my great grandmother. So this is very nostalgic. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Anna. And uh, Rosa, I just want to say a massive thank you to you. And if I can say this as well as I can, gong hei fa choi. Very good. <laughs> very good. Very good. You're a fast learner. Oh gosh, I wish. Rosa, thank you very much. You're welcome, you're welcome. And I'm really pleased to be here. Great. And I hope one day I'll be able to visit UK with a performance. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, if you do, please let us know because I'd love to go. Um, and so, um, goi. Um, goi. Um, goi. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. 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 Thank you.